Hello, this is James Reese, and welcome to another edition of Razorwire. We're going to continue on with our PCI DSS videos today. They're seemingly particularly popular. We've gotten a lot of new followers from that. Evidently, there's a lot of you out there that want to understand a little bit more about PCI DSS, the tricks of the trade, the challenges, the pitfalls, whatever you know it may well be. PCI DSS is a, a very big subject matter. It's a very long-winded subject matter in, in many respects. Uh, there's a lot to look at within it. Um, so I'm going to continue to do more videos on that. Um, if there's anything particularly you want me to cover, then I'm more than happy to do that. Just obviously drop us a drop us a mail, uh, get in touch with us, drop us a comment or whatever. And if you could like and subscribe to this channel, that would be fantastic. It's great for the algorithm. Um, so as I said, I've already done this once and the sound screwed up, so I'm doing it again. So I apologize if. Uh, <laughs> if I seem a bit disjointed, because I have to try and remember exactly what I said last time. Scoping is possibly one of the most important parts or to get right for PCI DSS. It's not something you can afford to get wrong. Now, what do we mean by scope? Um, scope is what needs to be compliant from a PCI DSS perspective. Now, you don't, it's not a PCI DSS requirement to have a segmented technical environment or any environment, um, but it is something that a lot of organizations do so they can restrict the requirements they need to meet for PCI DSS to the smallest possible area within their infrastructure, uh, both you know from a people perspective and from a um, and from a you know sort of technical people process, so on and so forth. Um, it is efficient way of doing and meeting PCI DSS compliance requirements. If if you decide that your scope is everything within your infrastructure, uh, then sometimes you can have quite a hard time meeting those requirements, especially if you've got a lot of areas where there's no car payments or no car car payments being taken or cards being stored in databases or whatever. So it is a common thing for people to to restrict their scope. However, it's not for the faint of heart, and you have to get it right. Why do you have to get your scoping right? If you get PCI DSS scoping wrong, then you could end up applying controls to areas that don't necessarily need them. Or even worse than that, um, you could end up not applying the right controls to an environment or mistaking that an environment is out of scope. Okay. This is why it's really, really important to get your scoping right. Not only get it right for the first time you go through PCI, but maintain a very, very good handle on your scope going forward. Failure to do that can cause you all kinds of problems when it comes around to audit time or if you have a breach or whatever. So you, you've got to get this bit down. If nothing else within in PCI compliance, this is probably one of the more, more important pieces, you know, Every bit as important as getting that final attestation of compliance signed off and, and passed by your QSA if you're you know, using a QSA and you're at that level. So with scoping, there's a bit of a dark art. Um, and as I try to teach everybody when it comes to PCI DSS compliance, there's three elements to it. There's three golden rules of compliance, uh, of, of compliance of scoping. So the first rule, if you have a system, service, or process that stores, processes, transmits, cardholder data, then it is in scope for PCI DSS. There's no ifs, there's no buts, it is in scope for PCI DSS. Now, what the requirements will be is something slightly different, but if you've got an e-commerce server which is taking card payments, it's in scope. If you've got a database stuffed full of cardholder information on an internal network segment, it is in scope. That database, that network is in scope. Okay. Easy rule. The second rule is if you have a system or a service that can directly connect to an environment where cardholder data is being stored, processed, or transmitted, it is also in scope for PCI DSS. Okay, so what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is if you have a flat network infrastructure and you have that database stuff full of cardholder information being stored in, a, you know, in that same flat network infrastructure, 
everything on that network infrastructure is in scope and everything that's directly connected is in scope. So if you have a perpetual VPN, you know, that connects that network to a, another network in your organization, then both of those networks are in scope. The reason for that is um, you can use, obviously, technology to springboard attacks on other types of technology. And if you don't have any restrictions in place to prevent communication and to protect access, then you're going to wind up finding that a large percentage of your environment is in scope. So if my laptop is on the same flat network infrastructure as your call center, where card payments are being taken by the, the call agents and entered in into whatever payment application or whatever they're using, um, then my laptop is equally as in scope along with the network and anything else that I can connect to um, as the, the call center agents and their machines that they're using and so on and so forth, uh, including, for instance, that database stuff full of cardholder information. So that means you have to apply compliance and PCI compliance um, to that environment in its entirety, okay? Now, the third rule, and this is the rule that's a little bit more complicated. Um, if you have a system or a service that indirectly connects to an environment where cardholder data is being stored, processed, or transmitted, it is potentially in scope. But that's very dependent on the security of the segmentation that you've undertaken, and you have to be able to prove that as well. Um, if you decide to segment off your database stuff full of cardholder information into its own network segment, walled off with firewalls and you're doing all the relevant things to protect that environment um, in a compliant manner, then you can restrict your compliance to that environment only. So you don't have to do it for the rest of the infrastructure because it's walled off and it's secured away and nobody can directly access it. They might be able to indirectly access it via means, they can't directly access it. So your compliance requirements will be assigned to that environment. There will be some other compliance requirements, people outside that environment that are potentially accessing that data, but there's all kinds of different ways you can, you can, you can do that. But from a very logical sense, those three rules should go through your head whenever you're dealing with PCI. If you've got a new project coming up where somebody has decided to create a new business offering where cardholder payments being taken in a way that's different from what you've done before, you need to run through those three three rules in your head. Um, once you've kind of done that, once you get used to that, it becomes much, much easier to designate what's in scope for PCI DSS and what's out of scope for PCI DSS. But you have to be really, really careful of doing it. If you get this wrong, then you could end up applying PCI DSS to areas where it doesn't need to be. But equally, on the flip side of that, you know, you, you could not apply it to areas which will be in scope. Now, it is the QSA that you have to prove your scope to, okay? And there's various different ways of doing it. But more often than not, QSA is, is pretty much involved in most of the first time that you go through PCI DSS. I do urge you to get a QSA involved, at least if nothing else to help you with the scoping. Um, and maybe with a bit of a gap analysis to kind of tell you where some of your challenges and, and potential problems may lie as you go through your project. Obviously, you know, when you go through that project or what we call remediation after you've had the scoping and gap, um, it's a good idea to involve the QSA either periodically or as part of that project to make sure that you're not implementing anything that's going to cause you problems when it comes to audit. And then, of course, the final stage is the audit itself. Now, we'll go through all of those in, in, in other videos, but scoping is by far the most important part of, of any PCI project. And as I said earlier on, emphasis on, it's ongoing as well. So if you're in an organization who likes to acquire competitors or other organizations where there's cardholder data um, being stored, processed or transmitted, you need to take that into account. So you need to look at your scope, look at that scope, and then obviously when if the company is being sort of merged in, absorbed, whatever, your scope can increase and you need to re-scope your environment and revalidate what you're doing and that all the requirements that you're meeting from your older compliance project to whatever it's going to be going forward. Um, it's important to maintain your scope and knowledge of your scope at any one time. You need to be able to prove it to that QSO as well. 
that's it really for scoping. I mean, it, it is quite a big subject. There's a lot of what ifs, that third rule about what's considered to be indirectly connected commonly causes the largest amount of discussion in that part of a project. Um, you know, what if we wall things off with a firewall? Well, it depends on the rules on the firewall. You know, what if we um, use funky sort of cloud technology to, you know, separate it out from the environment, you know, the corporate environment? Yes, you can do that. But again, what connections go through to that environment? Is there any third parties that need to come in? Is there any third parties that, that connect through to that? Because they can become part of your scope as well. As I said, Take time and effort looking at your scope and getting it right right at the beginning. Because once you've got it right, the rest of PCI DSS is just going through the standard and meeting the obligations that you need to meet within that environment. Um, most of PCI DSS is pretty standard stuff. It's not rocket science. There's a lot of documentation required. There's a lot of proving required. Um, but if you can get your scope right and you can reduce your scope, keep it restricted, then you're going to have a much easier time meeting PCI DSS compliance and proving it and obviously being audited. Nobody wants to be in a situation where you've gone through um, a whole process to become PCI compliant, only when you bring the QSA in at the, you know, to do the audit. If they haven't been part of that process, you can't prove your scope to them. And the QSA says, well, actually, your scope is much wider than, than, than you originally thought it was. Because then you quite commonly have to go back to the drawing board and redo parts of your project or, God forbid, all of your project. So just bear that in mind. It is well worth going through the expense of getting that QSA to just at least validate what your thoughts are on your scope um, or get them to help you build that scope and what it should look like. And, you know, feasibly get them to review it when changes occur, like as I explained bringing on board a new company that's been bought out by your organization where they've got methods of taking car payments because they will differ from yours, no doubt. Well, that's it for today for this particular video. Um, as I mentioned before, please like and subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment if there's anything you want us to, to cover on this channel, let me know, and then I'll be more than happy to have a look and, and provide additional content. But for now, look after yourselves as a razor wire and have a great weekend. Um, and be safe. Look after yourselves. Goodbye.